Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us on such a lovely June afternoon, which in my home country registers as outdoor season, and it's compulsory to just leave indoor spaces. So very much appreciated that you came here. I will be your host for this evening, Emreka Kinga Pop, the editor-in-chief of Eurozine. This is a network of um, a bit more than 100 magazines and culture journals based in Vienna. Um, but I promise you won't hear too much more about me because the, the highlight of this evening are these four people sitting here with us to discuss the notion and the concept or maybe more the initiative of, um, of doing something about the right now pretty much ailing European public sphere. Um, and I will go in a very random order, <laughs> introducing them very quickly. Francesca Bria, digital and innovation policy expert. I will tell you more about the speakers later. Oidia Oji, Palino, digital rights advocate. Mat Matthias Pfeffer, journalist. And um, the keynote speaker, Peter Pomerancev, who well, is a professional contrarian. He insisted I don't introduce him as a journalist or by any other titles, but he is delivering the conversation starter this evening. So, Peter, please take it away and introduce yourself more properly than I would. So, though I'm, I'm not a journalist, I do work with journalists, um, which is a huge honor. And, and I was just in Kiev, the town of my birth, yesterday with um, a team of journalists that I've been working with since the invasion um, as part of something called, called The Reckoning Project, which is a project, an NGO that, that I created together with the Ukrainian journalist, Natalia Gumenyuk, and the American, uh, the American journalist, Janine Di Giovanni. And what we do is we take journalists who are recording war crimes on the ground in Ukraine and put them together with lawyers um, in, order to, uh, in order to really bridge the gap between truth and justice so that um, the, the, the facts that are collected on the ground can then be turned into a legal strategy to end impunity. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is that... Um, Yesterday in Kiev, we presented our, our legal strategy to uh, the Prosecutor General, and I was asked to talk a little bit about the subject of today and the subject that I, I teach at university in Johns Hopkins in Washington, um, which is propaganda and disinformation. And, and what's very specific about the war crimes that Russia is committing in Ukraine is, is the role that propaganda plays in aiding and abetting them. So right before a maternity hospital is hit, you will have thousands of online accounts on Telegram, on Russian and international social media networks saying that actually this was a strike by the Ukrainians on themselves, or there were Nazis hiding inside this hospital using it to launch missile attacks. And to have all these, this sort of huge, coordinated, very inauthentic, very artificial online behavior, supported then by spokespeople on TV, all saying the same words at the same time, clearly there to aid and abet this crime. And of course, we see this kind of use of contemporary digital technology for repression for war crimes across the world, um, from the Philippines, where it's been very powerfully described by one of its victims, the journalist uh, Maria Ressa, who was under huge online attacks from the government, through to Mexico, um, Turkey, maybe Hungary, I don't know, maybe Reka can fill us in, but definitely the US where I live, this happens as well. But when the perpetrators of these attacks, which are completely integrated into mechanisms of repression, crime, and atrocities, when the journalists or the victims point out, hold on, this is, this is some sort of abuse, the people who are behind them, the people who work in the Putin propaganda system or for Duterte or, or for many others across the world, they kind of smile 
in a very cynical way and say, no, this is freedom of speech. This is what you guys fought for. We're not censoring you. This is freedom of speech. We have the right to this too. Why isn't this freedom of speech? It's more speech. And they're being cynical. They're being nasty. But philosophically, it's hard to argue with them. There's nothing in Article 19, the Declaration of Human Rights, um, around freedom of expression, which talks about disinformation. It's the right to impart and receive information. So what we're facing, and what this little anecdote tells us, is how in the digital age, maybe some of the ways that we thought information could guarantee democracy, the connection between information and democracy, some of the assumptions we had about what makes a democratic public sphere are starting to be questioned or even be turned against themselves. So I'm coming from Kiev, I'm here for one day, tomorrow I go back home to Washington DC to America, where you see a different kind of pathology in the public sphere, which has been augmented in the digital age. I will come back home to a country which is in the midst of a pre-election hysteria, which is already building. And America is a country where you have a huge plurality of media. And we always thought that pluralism was the essence of a democratic public sphere. An authoritarian one had top-down control, and a democratic one had many voices. America definitely has many voices, but what we seem to see is pluralism tipping over into a form of, I don't like the word polarization, ghettoization, I don't know what the right one is. People talk about echo chambers, which is a bad metaphor, bubbles, I don't know what the right metaphor is. All of them are faulty, but I do know that we have people living in a reality where they think that the past election was stolen, yeah? And we have a society where the kind of common engagement around a common public sphere is breaking down and is starting to influence the effectiveness of the democratic process. Maybe we'll talk a little bit today about what we mean by a democratic public sphere, but most philosophers who've tried to define it have thought about it as some sort of place where you can contest ideas, disagree, argue, exchange stories, but then also come to some sort of policy making and action and progress. And with that, I think we see the questioning of one of the main metaphors which was meant to define a democratic public sphere, the metaphor of a, of a marketplace of ideas, which is a very fashionable metaphor in America. You hear it all the time. But it seems to presuppose some sort of a audience uh, motivated by some sort of theory of rational choice where the best information, the most accurate information will rise to the top because people will select the most accurate information and the most sound ideas. But everything we know about human behavior suggests that we behave in a different way. And the online environment has been really designed, in the case of social media, to feed your confirmation bias, to allow you to avoid any kind of information which you find doesn't suit your existing worldview. Now, why is all of this important? Um, I don't know how many of you watched the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party. We watched it in my propaganda class at Hopkins, and it was a, a sort of a celebration of you know, mass behavior and mass thoughts, very much in the Soviet style. You had all these th scenes from sort of Mao Zedong through the Cultural Revolution and onto Xi Jinping, celebrating the great successes of the Chinese Communist Party. And then right at the end, it turned to the future, how the Chinese Communist Party will define the future. And there was this fascinating moment when this, it was on a stage big, bigger than this, this huge number five comes from the ceiling and everybody sort of dances round, kind of in a sort of praying to it, basically. 
And I thought, is this the five-year plan? Is this some sort of like, you know, advertisement of, of, of communist economics? It wasn't. It was 5G. <laughs> so the idea was because the CCP controlled 5G, it controlled the future. And the argument that the CCP seems to be making, I'm not an expert on it, but it seems to be intimating, and an argument that I hear from some voices in Silicon Valley as well, people like Peter Thiel, is that in an age of big data, in an age of this information chaos with troll farms and coordinated inauthentic behavior and echo chambers, democracy doesn't work anymore. Too chaotic, too much information. Little people with their little minds can't deal with this complexity. What you need is centralized knowledge, controlled by one force, either giant corporations, Peter Thiel's argument, or a centralized state, and they will make the decisions for you. You will give up all your information, all your data, all your privacy, but they will find you the ideal job. Maybe the ideal spouse definitely designed the ideal city for you. Will there be no traffic jams, no crime, and you will live perfectly just with not too much freedom of choice. But that era is over. Sure, totalitarianism lost in the 20th century, but now that it has 5G, now that it has big data, that is the only efficient system for the 21st century. That's their argument. So those are the stakes. The stakes are, can we make this woolly, very poorly thought through in academic circles, very poorly proven idea of a public sphere work, or can't we? Now, we'll be talking about that today, and I probably have to finish soon. I can feel Rekha's laser eyes burning into the back of my head, but I hope we will talk about... Very friendly laser eyes. It's a, love, it's a loving laser, a laser of love. Um, I hope we'll talk about regulation. My big conclusion from our work with the Reckoning Project in Ukraine is that I do not think that what the Russian government the Duterte government, the former Duterte government, and others do with these coordinated campaigns is to do with freedom of speech. Yeah. I think the sort of behavior yeah, is actually part of a crime and should be regulated like a crime. But it's a complicated subject. I hope we talk about it. I think we can talk about regulation, about the rights of the individual to understand the information environment around them. Yeah. Who's it being shaped by? Why do algorithms show us one thing and not another? Which of my own data is being used? We know none of that now. Yeah. We have more information than ever before, but less information about how the information environment is shaped. I hope we'll talk about digital spaces. Yeah. If social media seems to be not really encouraging democratic interactions, how do we design online environments that make the public sphere possible, and then who will fund that? And finally, hopefully we'll talk about what sort of content we'll need, because I think we have to re-investigate re the role of journalism in this new environment. But that's what I hope we'll discuss, and um, I think I was just under 15 minutes. That's good. Yeah, thank you for that. I do admire that you're still capable of conjuring so much ambition for an hour and a half conversation, but we'll try to talk about some of the things you've mentioned. I don't promise too much because we also have to stay alive at the end of the evening, so it's not going to be six more hours. Nevertheless, thank you for the conversation starter, Peter, and I will hand over to Francesca, but still remark that we will be taking audience questions in the middle of the conversation, unlike the usual format, simply because otherwise we will have like two sorry minutes left over at the very end, and that's just um, a humiliating experience both for the audience members and for us. So please prepare to ask your questions or add your comments right after Francesca. Uh, who is on the board of Italian Public Broadcasters, works on the project uh, New European Bauhaus, and me as a friend of some of the output of the old European Bauhaus as a serial flat renter. I'm very interested <laughs> in your input. So please take it away. And, um, and I'm also um, very interested in the very practical realizations you can tell us about um, of the 
of the rather theoretical framework that Beta drew up. Well, not really, like the, theory, the theoretical problems yeah. that you drew up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, always a pleasure to be in Amsterdam. And thanks, Peter, for setting the stage so well and also posing questions um, that require, I guess, a pragmatic approach or maybe even an outline of a plan of what to do, because obviously um, there is um, so much we can say about how urgent it is to construct a digital public space. So in the first place, maybe I want to be very clear. I think a digital public space doesn't exist at the moment, it must be built and it must be democratically governed. So I think it's uh, pretty urgent and I think um, occasions like this one are a way to start building alliances and start putting very high up this question as a political question for the future of Europe, for the future of our societies and for the future I think of people, of citizens, of democracy in general. So, uh, I just want to first of all say why I think it's so urgent to put democracy and the public sphere at the center of the political discourse. And I think, um, first of all, in the poly crisis we are living in, uh, which is, you know, you, you, you started with the war at the core of Europe, but also we live in post-pandemic times. Uh, we have, um, you know, a new kind of geopolitical situation that looks like a new world order and the kind of, you know, China versus US uh, Cold War II. Uh, we have energy crisis, we have um, food insecurity, we have the biggest threat, uh, man-made, uh, which is climate change, which has a dramatic impact, very, very concrete. I come from Italy now. We had one week of floods in Emilia Romagna with um, 20 people died and we have still water everywhere and we actually don't know how to act. You know it also here in the Netherlands last year and I mean extreme events are the norm and if we look at where we are heading, obviously we require radical imagination. So radical changes require radical imagination and that's why why we need a public sphere and a public space because we have to come up with the solution. And, and I think this is one of the, of the questions that you outlined the situation where if we think about the future of the digital society, we basically see two models. Yes, we see the US big tech, Silicon Valley big tech companies, which is at the moment, you know, a kind of oligarchic agenda, very monopolistic, very concentrated. And yeah, they get to own at the moment the digital infrastructures that we use every day and they get to own the data that we produce and they pretty much shape the infosphere with, we will say, a new form of algorithmic power that I think is endangering democracy and you made uh, some examples of that. We have another option that it's not the big tech in Silicon Valley, which is the big state. And you outlined, you know, okay, what is the view of the Communist Party of China? Some, at some point, very effectively so. I mean, for example, if they had a problem in the pandemic, they decided, okay, we lock down the population for two years. And yes, it's true, they gather a lot of information centrally. And possibly only the Communist Party of China knows how to act on the situation. And I think for a European standpoint, this doesn't seem very much preserving uh, democracy, the rule of law, and our fundamental rights as we define them. So I think we urge Definitely need a third option, not the big tech, not the big state, but possibly what I've been defining and trying to apply in an applied way in my work, which is a big democracy. We need a big democracy because I think it's about empowering, well, first of all, yes, preserving our fundamental rights and our democratic public sphere as in the kind of liberal democratic sense. But also, um, I guess we need to empower people. We need to empower citizens and communities to find out, you know, what is the solution to climate change? What is going to be the solution to affordable housing? What is the future of education that we want? What is the future of healthcare? So again, it's not really a media problem. It's a, it's a problem about how we are going to shape the society of the future. And it has to be done, for me, in an accountable and democratic way, involving people and communities. So I believe that still 
this is the role of Europe, that if there is a reason why we want to build a more political Europe, why we want to fight to have a European space, is to uh, put this agenda uh, forward. We do have a problem with the business model, of course. I mean, you talked about very much polarization, fake news, disinformation, this algorithmic power that we all fear now when we hear about artificial general intelligence, right? I mean, when we hear a few people on the planet, like Elon Musk, like, you know, the OpenAI, uh, um, Sam Alton, and these people acquiring a superpower and telling us, okay, we are going to build general artificial intelligence. 21 billion uh, dollars were invested only this year in building general artificial intelligence. And, okay, how, so the business model, which is based at the moment of the manipulation and let's say monetization of personal information and data as the new currency in the digital space, this is the problem. So this is not actually going along with the regulatory environment that Europe is setting. So if you look at all these bad words, sorry to <laughs> remind the General Data Protection Regulation, the Artificial Intelligence Act, the Data Act, the European Media Freedom Act, um, you know, this is a, I think an attempt from Europe to say, let's build a constitution for the digital age. A constitution that protects people and empower people to be Dig to be fully have digital citizenships right. I think this is the great part, and I think this is what we need for the world, actually, not only for Europe. Where I see the problem, and, and I close, I think um, at some level, we can't only regulate. I mean, we can talk about what's good, the regulatory framework in Europe, and we should push for it. But if we only regulate, and then we ask, okay, can you please, Elon Musk, <laughs> implement this because you own Twitter? Or then we go to the public um, broadcast media. I sit in the board, you said, of, of RAI. You know, we had 20 years of Berlusconi in, you know, monopolizing the TVs, and so Italy is, I think, one of the problematic space. But now we have a new government that's pretty right-wing, and they decided to control the public media. So they changed the CEO, they change directors. Is this a model for the public sphere we want that is state controlled and that is the, the media and the information and the journalists are actually controlled by the governments? No. Do we want the oligarchs from Silicon Valley to control the basic infrastructures that we use? No. So just to, to close, I think we have an infrastructure problem. We have to build public digital infrastructures, for example, like data sovereignty, data that is owned by the people in a democratic way. We need a digital identity that's encrypted and that's public and preserve our fundamental rights, for example, information self-determination. So you control the data and you decide who access the data, on what term, and to do what. And it's much more democratic and probably we're going to need a digital payment system. So this is the infrastructure. Overall, you will say who is producing the content. Maybe a public media broadcast can produce the content. But I think um, just to end uh, my speech, I prefer to think about democracy and the public sphere in the sense of um, Claude Lefort. So he was saying that um, a democracy is a form of society in which place of power is represented as an empty space. So it's not going to be you know, controlled by the state, and it's not going to be controlled by oligarchic private powers. It's going to be pluralistic, a variety of different competing ideas, and it's going to be built by the power to the people, it governed in a democratic way. I think that's the task, and how to do it? We need the intelligence, the collective intelligence of people, because we have to be innovative, and again, radical changes come with radical ideas, so we can't just repeat what we have done in the past, we have to build a new digital public, public sphere that allow for this empty space to be positively, you know, taken over by communities and, and, and people. Yeah, thank you. Maybe it's the homo sovieticus in me. I was born and raised a couple of years in a, in a then still actively communist country and then went to public education in 1990 where the teachers, substitute teachers would come in and sometimes ask us, oh, so you guys didn't learn Russian and we had no idea why that was meaningful. Like nobody bothered to tell us. So maybe that's just this background in me that, 
keeps sort of ringing the bell saying this kind of open, accessible, like properly plural European media space had not existed before in, in, the, in the shape that it would be a healthy, self-sustaining system. So I'd like to just reiterate that we're not losing some kind of wonderland that we had built and maintained and then some evil intervention came and took it away, not that you guys implied, but in the public discourse, this is kind of um, sort of um, an undertone that I sense that there is, there was a democratic, sh uh, there was a huge democratic push and everything was great and then came <laughs> the liberals. It, I don't think it's quite that simple, but maybe it's also the homo sovieticus in me that clings on what you said and also what Peter phrased very eloquently, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> That's like the core question. So who is going to, because as you said, the EU has been way less reluctant to legislate than, for instance, the US, which it sort of superstitiously has kept kept itself from legislating, especially in the digital sphere and in the media sphere. Um, so legislation is not that much lagging as, for instance, investment, which on the other hand, when we're talking about, you know, on, on, the, on the digital, like public infrastructure scale, I think investment, you know, there, there, are, there is quite some space left blank that, that needs, but, but you, I, I, I have the feeling that you think otherwise? No, 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 no. I think I think you're posing very important questions. I think this is a moment where we have a lot of investment. So yes, I partly disagree because I think um, uh, there hasn't been a moment, maybe in 30, even more, <laughs> 40 uh, years, that Europe, I mean, Europe finally is putting a lot of money on the table. And there is massive investment. I mean, the next generation EU, that was the post-pandemic, really massive investment. There is the digital <coughs> decade of Europe, so it's not only regulation. There is. Uh, billions of investment, both in the public sector, but also leveraging the private sector. So both for building public digital infrastructures, but also investment in startups and investment in scale-ups and companies. So I think at the moment we have a lot of investment that's uh, there. And also if you think about the public media broadcast, where is the money coming from? They are funded by taxpayers, so general taxation. And I think we all accept that it's good to fund public media if we think that the public media is democratically governed and there is a space in the public media to express you know, a multiplicity of views in society. Yeah, so I think it's more about how it's governed than the investment, because I think investment both in the kind of taxation sense and then we have massive investments at the moment, I think it's not the most problematic uh, thing that we have. Obviously the scale, if you're talking about digital infrastructure as quantum computing, micro microchips and uh, artificial intelligence, I mean that's an industrial policy conversation, we could go into that, but I think it's... Um, uh, but still, uh, a, a lot of money. It's too late for that. A lot of, a lot, in the a lot in of the money. Evening. It's now there to be to be used. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Let's throw it to the floor. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Please. Um, I see a gentleman in the second row. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mm. And actually, it answers all your questions. And it will also improve the issue with uh, fake news that we discussed later on. And Francesca would like to invite you there because we actually are going to do it there. It's a 1 billion euro program from the European Commission. It's part of the way that all answers to the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hands up if anybody wants to uh, react, reflect, ask, or comment on what has previously been said, or shall we just move on with the conversation? I thought it was intriguing what you mentioned that in the States, more pluralism seems to lead to more polarization, or you didn't want to use the term. Um, and I, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that, and what do you think drives that dynamic? Um, so, 
I mean, I, I don't know whether you, you, you followed this amazing trial in the US of Fox News. So Fox News was taken to, to court for kind of damages and defamation by uh, Dominion, the company that kind of makes the election voting systems. Because Fox News had spread the lie that their systems had manipulated the election result. Um, and it forced Fox News to open up their emails and commu insider communication. And it was clear that everybody, including Rupert Murdoch, the owner, and Tucker Carlson, the most conspiracy pushing presenter, knew this was, they were saying lies, but they felt they had to follow their audience. So the audience wanted, demanded unreality. And, and so it's the audience pushing them in a certain sense. Now, why is the audience moving further and further? You might want to look at the work of Yohai Benkler, who's uh, an academic at Harvard, who kind of looked to the dynamic between the online space and legacy media. So because the online space is even more algorithmically attuned to indulging and encouraging um, your most, again, I'll use another very loaded term. I don't like this, any of these terms, polarized, tribal, these are terrible terms. Your most um, fascist behavior, let's go full out. <laughs> let's go all this, let's just dive in. Um, that sort of behavior, reality denying, dehumanizing, um, um, hiding away from the world and seeing enemies everywhere type of behavior. Because it, it indulges it, it creates an environment where various kind of online media feed that. And then the legacy media like Fox News find themselves pulled along. He sort of showed how that had worked in the 16 election. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like he was showing how Breitbart and people were sort of pushing Fox News further and further into F land, let's call it that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic, which is not simple. You know, you've got the algorithmic factor, you've got the human factor, you've got the profit factor, and it all snowballs and nothing breaks it. I mean, I think what you're talking about is, if that is the logic, what is going to break that? And in America, there is nothing to break it. Yeah, just a small reminder that there are, of course, I don't think that you're implying this, but there are these factors pushing media like Fox and others towards any sort of radicalization, whatever the direction may be, although, of course, nowadays it's mostly toward the extreme right. But, but then those decisions to never let go of a portion of an audience or never take up a conflict with, with the people who are your most loyal base, those are human decisions. Those are never, you know, you can't really blame an algorithm or Facebook or whatever other, like, seemingly external factor for your, well, you know, lack of integrity also feels like a sad excuse <laughs> in this situation because it's just... It's so weak for what's going on. So just let's let's be clear about this. Editors can make decisions about, you know, losing a portion of their audience at the expense of not lying or not lying even more. Um, I think I'm reiterating things for no good reason. But let's <laughs> please, if you have any questions or comments in the meantime, do raise your hands. We will move on with the conversation, but we don't have to like restrict the audience participation to a smaller portion of the discussion. Um, I, I saw two hands, right? Behind each other. Is that in the third row? No, that was a misunderstanding. Okay. First row. Yes. Please, lady, in the, th in the first row. Am I allowed to ask a question now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Francesca, I think this question is for you. So, I would like to propose a fourth model, I think, <laughs> a model of small tech, uh, because right now we are so dependent on big tech and we have to, like you said, ask Elon Musk to take something out, which is insane. So I'm dreaming of this, this communication landscape where there are thousands of TikTok, where there is a, there, where there's a Peter Graham and a Francesca talk, and there's so many, so many online uh, spaces where we can all choose one that resonates with us. So uh, maybe they can all compete on like privacy levels or something amazing like that. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you, am I being delusional or is this something we can achieve by regulation? Yeah, 
Well, I guess this is going to be a lot about probably the conversation, so I also am um, interested to know what the other things. But in my opinion, um, this is actually the model that I'm advocating for. But I think in order, for example, if we take Europe as a possible place where this model can be experimented, I think there is no contradiction uh, between saying we need some public digital infrastructures, which are the basis of that. So for example, this data spaces, which is going to be owned by a data trust democratically, and you own your digital citizenship, it's encrypted, your data is not everywhere. Uh, digital payment system, probably we are gonna need a digital euro that's a public, like, like a public currency. So those are like almost, let's say, the building blocks of this democratic space. But then on top of it, and this is going to be how we imagine this ecosystem, like how about what is it offline? Yeah, so you have the Bali, you have festivals, you have small editors, you have the bigger editors, you have a lot of plurality in the way that content is produced and culture is produced. By the way, we also have the problem that yes, we have oligopolies in all sectors, content production now, we have big houses, they're all merging, so we need to monitor also that. But I envision it in this kind of sense, and possibly we are in Amsterdam, I mean, I remember I was a kid, but I learned this from Amsterdam. You had the digital city plan, actually my friend Marlene Sticker, she's not around today, that she was advocating for this digital you know, city that was owned democratically. VPRO, you have the radios. I mean, here you, you were the place where these digital public spaces were actually conceived, even in the Bali, the next five minutes. I mean, I was young, but I remember it. So somehow, <laughs> I don't want to look like a bit nostalgic here, but so it's not the nostalgia that you were saying, I guess, like going back to where, I, I agree completely with your comment. But I guess, you know, yes, why the digital public sphere can't look a bit like that, but I'm afraid some public infrastructure must be there. And I think we need to recuperate this idea that the public funding them. So where the money come from, I think we have to uh, require to reconquer the public space and require stable long-term investments for critical infrastructures of our society that cannot be, I think, in the hands of, you know, few private players. That, that is my view. Yeah. Gentlemen in the second row and then the, sir, in the striped shirt. I, I hate these denominators, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just... Let me pull a ball into the game. And actually, one thing which probably interesting to discuss is a trust and a reputation. The society stands on that. And that's element of this European digital program. Imagine a world where we just remove data from platforms and return data to people, like Tim Berners-Lee suggested, form of website. And then people, they, whenever they put any post and any, anything in the internet, they receive likes, dislikes, whatever. And if people have these cryptographic keys, it's Francesca suggested, all these likes, dislikes will be cryptographically signed and they will come to the platforms like Facebook, but they will go through platform to your personal port, your personal website. So through your life, after several years, you collect a lot of likes and dislikes from very many people, cryptographically signed. It's not like, you know, nobody knows who you are. People will know who you are. So after some time, you can cal calculate your e-karma, you know, reputation. When people have reputation, it is quite real, trust me from cryptographic point of view. When people have this reputation, whenever news somebody puts online, this news has a name behind it. And that's probably a way to go. So I suggest to discuss in this direction because right now all this news, all, all, all things Russian propaganda does, they use the fact that in internet, no dog knows that you are a dog. But if all people are authenticated and identified, it's not possible to put propaganda into the system. You always have to there is always clear who is behind it and what is e karma and reputation of that person. So idea is to restore in the digital world the reality of the physical world with identity, reputation, etc. And that's probably direction towards towards the situation when we don't have fake news, when we have real democracy, when we can have electronic election, electronic money, whatever is needed. If I understand your con uh, comment correctly, you are advocating for more direct uh, response or consequences for one's digital actions, right? Just like in the real world. 
I see. Well, I would argue that in the real world, in print newspapers, you used to be able to publish without your name. So you know it's sort of back and forth. But thank you for that. And the um, gentleman in the fourth row had his hand up. Uh, well, the gentleman before me is clearly a technologist, and, but I am as well. Um, I have background and I'm active in artificial intelligence. Um, I actually want to comment, I, don't, I, don't, I won't be able to articulate this uh, properly, but uh, I, it seems to me and that, um, especially by the, with the policy makers, too much is driven by rationality and the assumptions of, that are too rational that our information, access to information will solve everything. It, 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 we will have, live happily ever after. I, I seem to have come to a conclusion that we need to go back again to the real world, but experiences of some sort that we need to, um, because I think why we end up in bubbles and, and in, these, in these echo chambers is because we're actually driven by irrational uh, impulses and by our emotions rather than rationality which was assumed uh, on our behalf. So somehow we need to go back to feeling things as well, experiencing things. Yeah, thank you. There are usually suggestions when the system is based on an assumption that just doesn't work, maybe we do have to change the system to adapt to the reality of people making decisions. Gentlemen in the third row and then after that, I'd like to go to Oidia. Um, yeah, I would like to know how this digital public sphere will be funded in a way that makes sure that it's not becoming populist, like the example of Fox giving. Uh, also, making sure that it's not becoming elitist, that the majority of the population doesn't feel it's represented by the decisions that are being taken. So, how to solve that question? There are very few things in life that I like more than the audience doing my job. And you just did that. Thank you for that. Because I had been meaning to throw the question to Oidia Ocipalino, who is a digital rights advocate and works with the European Network Against Racism. I'm reading the paper just so that I don't mess up because institution names for me are... Sorry, but out of, out of the scope of my working memory. Um, I'm very happy to have you on the panel. You. You know, you are sort of the jack of all trades to like broaden a perspective in this discussion. How do we make sure that this digital space that we are talking about needing to democratize, needs, needing basically to be built in a large part, that it includes people, that it is accessible to people, that we don't just repeat and, and reproduce the biases and the exclusions that the, that whatever types of public spaces had worked uh, worked with for hundreds of years. Um, thank you for the question. Um, to be honest, when you are saying things like reproducing biases or reproducing errors, in the end we are talking about reproducing our society. This is something that we have to take into account. Like in the end, the digital sphere, the digital scene, it is just a, a copy paste of our society. And the thing is, what strikes me the most is that we are still, um, we are still, uh, yeah, we, 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 are, we still say, hey, how this can happen? Like, when there's people who have already been experiencing this for lots of years, decades, and, and it's something that's systemically happening, historically happening. Our history in the end is supposed to teach us something, but we are unlearning instead of learning, right? And um, for example, uh, I was uh, writing down something about when you were talking about the gap between truth and justice. Uh, I was thinking like, who is building the justice and who's building the truth? Are they the same people in the end? I think that at the moment we are in this place in which the same people are creating justice and truth at the same time. And how can we make sure that in the end it is completely different people? Like, uh, not the majority, the majority plus the minority, to make sure that all the parts are always sitting at the table, speaking, and in the end having a conversation and being critical of what is happening at the moment. Because I think that at the moment we have lack of criticism about what is happening. We cannot stop. I mean, we have to stop for a moment and say, hey, what is happening? Like, is this real? 
And if it's real, how it, affect, how it is affecting me and how it is affecting somebody who is radically, completely different to me. So when you have this kind of perspective, you can start thinking, designing, or even envisioning a third option, a way in which we can make sure that fundamental rights are always there. Uh, it is something that we always forget. I mean, there, there are certain kind of rights that we take, we take them for granted. And nowadays, we, I mean, we are in a space that it's shrinking for many people, for many communities. And I'm happy that you were bringing out the, 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 the example of the Philippines, because I'm half Filipina. And, uh, and it's really interesting how you were saying, talking about that, well, the, the repression that uh, the government is, 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 is really reproducing towards uh, journalists, for example, it is just for the sake of freedom of speech, right? And, uh, but at the same time, countries like the Philippines or Mexico that you were also naming, uh, they are places like really important hubs for many big tech companies to moderate content. Mm. And how this content, and, and in the end, many of these people who are moderating content, when they are using the digital space, they are invisible. So how can we make sure that the people who are really visible, I mean, they are doing the labor that we don't want to do, which is say, hey, I want to dis discard this, or I don't want to uh, I really uh, consume violence, let's say, or I don't want to consume certain kind of things. It could be violence, or it could be, I don't know, I don't want to see dogs on my feet, for example. So how can we make sure that also the people who are working for us, because in the end, the technology we have to think, like even my mobile phone or, or whatever, my microphone, like the people who were creating this, it was not us, like we were designing it, we were envisioning it. But in the end, the hands, the ones who were creating it were people from marginalized groups. People who, got, who really don't have a say on a digital space and that they should have really a, a, a say on this, right? Because they are a really, part, a really important part of this. And at the same time, like, how can we define the future with these people? Uh, because nowadays we know that uh, as, as the society as we have it right now, they don't have a say. Um, and if they have a say, it is just like, because they are invited, uh, just to give like another kind of perspective. But how do we make sure that it's not, we don't want them because of this? How do we make sure that in the end, they have something to, to also like provide? They could also provide many other questions. Like for example, they could also give us lessons about privacy, about how the labor that they have to create or reproduce in order to make sure that their privacy, their privacy is really taken into account and the harms that many times digital spaces are, 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 are providing to them. Because we always forget that those who are more harmed in the digital spaces are the people who come from minorities or from uh, marginalized communities. And the harms that we are, that, that are, that are receiving are even more exponentially at the on a digital scene more than in, in our society. But they already have the experience outside on the offline uh, on the offline world, like, right? So in the end, uh, we are talking about systemic problems, things that we have to solve with a digital scene, with a digital uh, uh, atmosphere or without. And until we don't solve like the most uh, basic things, the, the, that, the essence of, how, of why we are here in this planet and why we're supposed to be collaborating, because in the end, without collaboration, we wouldn't be here. I mean, it's, it's completely basic, right? And how do we might make sure that the collaboration is being done not only for, by the people who are in power, but also those who need to remember that they, 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 they are also part of our society? Yeah, when you say, so how do we make sure, how do we ensure, all I'm thinking is like, when are you gonna tell me how? <laughs> because, you know, the, the traditions that, that I was socialized in, and I guess many of us also, this is not a, Soviet experience per se, is that there's the journalist who goes out from the editorial room to heroically report on poor people and then go home and not be quite so poor. Um, or the social worker who, well, at this point is probably as poor as their clients in many countries around Europe and around the world. But so there's always like an outreach strategy, but how, how does an involve, involvement strategy look in an environment that is just being built? Well, uh, first it is just to gather all the voices and make sure that all the voices are there. 
um, it is something that is crucial. I mean, you cannot design something if there's somebody that is missing there in the table, because many, probably there will be something that will come out, like let's say a racist algorithm or racist system, that in the end tells you you are here or you're not part of it, right? Um, and uh, it's not enough, because uh, in the end, it, we should try to find out more ways in which we could try to democratize also like the creation of technology. Um, and how? Well, it is something that if I had the recipe, I would, I would not be sitting here, I think. I was hoping that you had like a two-sentence package that I can just jot down and then never credit you with again. Okay, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's fair. I mean, my understanding here is that we have to build it into the governance system as it is being built, not like a token person as a diversity consultant who sometimes says, Maybe we could have people of color, and then everybody says, yeah, maybe sometimes, and then just move on, which is, of course, the, uh, quite, a, quite a usual reaction. Uh, but let's throw it then to the, the person of solutions. This is, I mean, you're not the only person of solutions around this table, of course, but Matthias has, uh, the two of us have branded him before the conversation like this. So Matthias Pfeffe, a longtime journalist, a philosopher, by original trade and um, a consultant to the European Broadcasters Union, but also the initiator of the, the Council for European Public Space, which is in and of itself sort of being launched with this conversation, not launched, like there's gonna be no fanfares or confetti thrown around because Why this not? is an initiative <laughs> starting now. You are suggest, well, you're not suggesting, you are already making a move on this front. Please tell us what, um, what this organization and this initiative is and how it's taking form just now. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, um, I think it was a lot said about the reason to um, start such an initiative um, before, uh, and I could not agree more to what was said. Uh, maybe I, I would like to start with the, with the, with the story. And last week I had the chance, or the, not the honor, uh, to, to be part of Sam Altman's European tour, open AI tour it was called. And um, I was there at the university in Munich where I teach. Uh, and where he uh, was, uh, um, he was really celebrated like a pop star uh, from the students and from the politicians and so on. This is a new groundbreaking technology and the man who brought it to, to us and so on. And he compared um, ChatGPT with the invention of the atomic bomb, which was quite a statement. And um, he is part uh, of this group of people like Peter Thiel. He's, I think he's a friend of him, the Singularians, uh, and with their dystopian fantasies. And um, I think, in my view, it is part of their PR to make that technology very powerful and to tell the public, uh, please don't touch it. Because he <laughs> said then at the same time, uh, yeah, we named ourselves OpenAI, but we decided not to make the technology open source because it's too dangerous. <laughs> and, um, and I saw him, I, I watched then a video on Twitter where uh, he, he was also in the White House a week before, uh, and Kamala Harris, mm. God, God save her, or uh, it's good that she's still alive. I saw her first time since years, I think. Uh, she, uh, she hosted the, the, the chiefs of Microsoft and all the other companies among them, Sam Altman and uh, uh, Joe Biden, came into the room in this small video that I saw and he said, oh, it's a, it's a very um, a powerful technology that you build. And we are very happy that you're here today to educate us. And I was quite shocked. Because if these people educate us about the power or the possibilities of these technologies, and if they say how we do have to regulate it or not to regulate it, that would be really a, a tremendous danger uh, to human, uh, uh, to, to mankind, because, um, and then it would really be an atomic bomb. Why, why do I say that? Um, I think we could go back like 20 years when the internet was almost at the beginning with social media and some other technologies, and it was complete unregulated. And then a phase of like 
20, 25 years, which, which where, the, where the big tech companies raised almost without any kind of uh, law regulation, uh, brought us a kind of a wild west situation where they, and, and, and the results we are facing today, especially in terms of the digital uh, public sphere and of the information sphere, because um, this technology, digital technology and in special uh, artificial intelligence are very powerful and they can be used to make a lot of money, to make a lot of, uh, to gain a lot of power and to destroy uh, a lot of public spaces or public goods which were so far public. And um, I think um, when we look what, what digital technologies have done to the, to the communication space, we have to reclaim this space now um, and we have to make clear that, um, that uh, this can't go on like this. Um, ChatGPT has really the power to transform journalism because the texts are created by automats and that's much cheaper than journalists. Um, and we will see a flood of texts and of products being produced by this technology. And the company who owns the technology and who knows the algorithms controls almost a lot of our information sphere with that. And um, this information is being gained by, by people over decades and it belongs to, to, to the public to solve our problem and not to um, uh, bring us new problems. So now coming to the um, Council for European Public Space uh, that, I'm, that I'm happy to, to start in these weeks uh, with the help of the European Cultural Foundation where I'm very thankful for. I think this could be an initiative to bring together some uh, experts, personalities, Europeans, um, that have the same kind of uh, feeling that we are in a momentum where we can act and where we can turn around maybe this development a little bit by making the most uh, important part of the problem, the digital technology, to part of the solution. Um, I can tell you one example. If you look at Europe, uh, there's one problem why Europe can't act like the US or China in terms of technology. It is a huge market. The European market is very relevant for all these companies, but it's not a real united Europe. We don't act like one a real entity or unity. Why is that so? Because we do not have a European public sphere. And the reason for that was always mentioned uh, because of the cultural borders and not at least the language borders. But these language borders do not exist anymore. They are just gone by technology. It's, it's, we are living first time in history in a situation where we could use this kind of technology to translate every European language in every other real, uh, by real time uh, and we could, we could really get um, a European public sphere by opening up the national bubbles, which are a big problem. Uh, in some European countries, we don't even have an independent media system, which is grotesque, because this is a prerequisite uh, for every kind of democracy. And by the way, it is guaranteed by fundamental rights, because it's part of the, of the fundamental right that you have access to information, free access to information. And if that's not guaranteed anymore, like it is already uh, in some European member states, uh, then we don't have a real democracy. So we do have the obligation, not only, it's not only by, by accident to decide this, we do have the constitutional ob obligation in Europe uh, to really build a secure, uh, information space or infrastructure for the digital information a space that we live in because without information we can't act and without common information and a common ground of information we can't act together and we can't uh, solve our problems uh, they were named we have a lot of problems uh, these days and they can only be solved uh, with informed citizens uh, that are able to uh, articulate their opinions, that build up their opinions and to act together in a democratic way. So 
I think it's very clear. It's not a new solution that we need. We only need to turn around the perspective. We should not allow any more companies or other entities to shape our societies and disrupt our democracies by technology. But instead of that, we should start to shape that technology in order that it serves democracy and serves our society and let us help solve our problems. For minorities, for example, it's a fundamental right that every person has a right to, to speak and uh, to, uh, to live in a free society. Um, and uh, this should be in the digital place the same right as in the analog world. Don't let the rules of the unregulated digital world um, be adopted to the analog world. That would be a very, very bad situation for us all. So um, I think there's a lot to do um, in um, making advocacy for um, a real democratic digital public space in Europe. And um, and a little bit be optimistic, not only always be defensive against um, uh, American uh, platforms or uh, big tech companies or Chinese uh, state-run uh, companies, but also doing own European projects. That would be a very good way. And as I said, this technology can help us. Um, Umberto Eco, you are uh, you're a very good writer in Italy, once said, the language of Europe is translation. And we have a complete a revolutionary translation engine there. And it's working for wrong purposes, for a, for a wrong model of attention economy, of profit maximization, and not for the common good. And we should train these models to work for the common good, for Europe, for basic values, for fundamental values, uh, because we really have to defend them. I mean, it's not granted that we live in a democracy. It's not granted that we have fundamental rights, that we have a rule of law. These three elements are absolutely basic and they are under threat. And it's quite simple. I mean, imagine a world where every information is not proven. I mean, it's just, it's just built up by a machine or by someone who is behind that machine. Um, Peter described it uh, from his experience in America, and that's called bullshit. It's called bullshit by Harry Frankfurt, who is a very good uh, and famous philosopher. I can recommend that. And the difference between bullshit and lies are that the liar knows the truth, and he don't, don't tell the truth. But the bullshitter, and he means people like, um, like Trump, uh, they, they don't care about the truth at all. They're just saying what they want, what, the, what, what brings them forward and what gains power for them. And ChatGPT is the most powerful bullshit machine that was ever built. Yeah, but that's quite an attitude to come out of defeatism saying or suggesting that one should initiate and build their own. So that's the advocacy work that the Council for European Public Space is taking, taking on. And Kind of sneakily, we can also mention that with headed by the European Cultural Foundation, um, about a dozen or, well, actually with more partners, uh, quite a bunch of um, organizations from across Europe are gearing up starting this July to build a new infrastructure to syndicate um, content, video, audio, and articles as well from across um, preferably hundreds of, uh, of media. We are going to focus on small and mid-scale media, also including community media, because the idea is that to break monopolies and oligopolies, you don't need a single alternative. You need to nurture an ecosystem where many alternatives can stay alive, can get a voice, and make use of the technology that now can break language barriers because much of the European public sphere, as you also mentioned, is still caught in national silos, and there really isn't an external reason for that anymore. So let's see how this works out. I'm very, very excited for it. I already saw at least two hands up. So, sh yes, please, can we get the light back on the audience, please, and take up another round of questions? 
Yes, thank you a lot. And indeed, as a gentleman before, I'm also working with AI, and I'm very happy you raised the issue of generative AI. Uh, one of the things that I'm personally very worried about is that you can generate content that is untrue. And one of the fundamental values of democracy is to being able to make your autonomous choice within the realm of information that is out there. And I see that being threatened by generative AI. And I was very curious to your opinions about that, your opinion perhaps also from Peter. Thank you. Yes, um, I absolutely agree. As I said, I mean, um, I, I would agree to Sam Altman even, this is an atomic bomb, but the melting point will be in democracy. It will, I mean, if, as I said, I mean, if you really, um, this machine is very powerful and we only saw now ChatGPT4 and he's already talking about ChatGPT6 and we don't know what this is doing. And, and the other thing is that he said this is the first step to the so-called artificial general intelligence, AGI, which will then end up someday and he is convinced in that, in, that uh, in a kind of a super intelligence. We don't, we don't have to speculate if that's true or if it's coming, but it, it is a, a kind of a general AI because it can combine pictures, uh, music and words and language and it's hacking our language system. We, d we, we should not Images forget that. Also. Image. Yeah, I mean, and language is what brought us where we are. I mean, we are homo uh, sapiens, but on the other side, we are zoon on log on politicon, as Aristoteles said. We are the, 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 the animal with the language. And now they are hacking the language, and the language is, uh, you know, the machines are creating uh, own stories. I mean, you can give in, everybody knows now, you can prompt, and uh, it's, it's fantastic what it brings out, but it's not true. There are no links, there are no sources. Uh, our enlightenment and the Renaissance, they started with the sources. Back to the roots, where are the sources? You have to give up uh, sources for, for uh, um, com to getting to knowledge. But these machines are very intransparent and they are very manipulative. And um, so... Um, I'm, I'm going to have to briefly antagonize you because generating bullshit is not unique or spe well, yeah. specific no, no, to I AI. <laughs> and just in terms of like content generated yeah. on the average, I think what we're dealing with is that is a, a multiplication yeah. of the yeah. volumes of content, like a, a really huge uh, or, or new magnitude of content, yeah. but we're not really dealing with new qualities in on truth in that sense. What we're dealing with is an audience and, and social systems that need to adapt to this new magnitude. So the, the new level of noise. Nothing is really new, but it's an amplifier of what we already know. And it makes things, it can turn t things into a new quality. That's what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. democracy is really under threat. There, uh, our research is done to that. Uh, we, we do have less democratic uh, people living in democratic societies than 30 years ago, less not more. And uh, the perspective after uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain was just the opposite. So, and we see that democracy is under threat, not only in Europe, but in, in, in a lot of other countries. And we do have a, a new conflict of systems. And this technology is very helpful for autocratic systems. But my thesis is that designed in the right way, we can also use it, and we should do so very, very quickly to use it to help democracy and autonomy and freedom of people and not to undermine it. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it's not the technology itself that thinks to do something. Because, I mean, another thing of... I'm sorry, on that note, I'm going to be very autocratic with you and yeah. then hand it over to Francesca <laughs> no, so yeah. we can take one yeah. more question. I just want to say a couple of things on this because I, I guess Sam Altman, he's, uh, what he's trying to really do when he goes and speak about OpenAI and ChatGPT is that he's trying to bring the focus away from the real deal, which is regulating not ChatGPT, but OpenAI, the corporation, yes? And they're like talking about this atomic bomb in a sense of, oh my God, you know, it's too powerful, don't touch it, or yeah, let's regulate it. But that's not really the issue. The issue is the concentration of power in the hands of those companies. And the fact that, you know, the majority of the investment now going from in, in generative AI 
it can only, it, it's closed. So it's basically only the companies that work in those, only the, the people that work in those companies have access to the unrestricted AI systems and can decide, you know, what's happened if and so on. So it's very hard, for example, now you're working on the AI Act, which is the attempt of the European uh, Union to say how we regulate it, it's very hard to do it because they don't have access to the real functioning of the systems. Then, okay, we can argue that even the problem is how they scale. It's not so much that the technology is new, it's the hyperscaler, so the computational capacity and you know the probabilistic systems, where, whether it's a black box. So you don't know really when you put in what you get out. And that, but that's, that's exactly like raising it's, children. It's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but no, because, no, 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 but hold on a second, because it's children what's are difficult. Reasonable. So rethinking trust, I rethinking so. uh, authority and so on. But it's also what makes this technology really exciting because the output is actually really good at some level. And we know that. And in particular, you guys working on that. And so it's like almost like we have to rethink those systems. But I just wanted to say, so the problem is for me, really, and that's why there is all this PR campaign, do not touch the companies. There are three or four on the planet. Mm -hmm. Only three or four on the planet that can, at this moment, because of the computation capacity, the investment and the scale control this technology. And I think that's the real issue. And the other thing I wanted to say, for me it's very interesting to see, for example, artists coming together to opt out <laughs> from you know the systems and how they use their arts work in without asking you know permission so the artists are opting out there is 4 billion now um, oeuvre, you know, artistic work in this uh, data system where they're trying to say, you can't actually use it or you can't reproduce my voice without, you know, paying me publicity rights. So it's almost like claiming back the collective ownership of this information and data, which I think is going to be a critical democratic thing because it's all the knowledge that we produce, which is just taken by the systems without asking any permission and giving back to society anything. And finally, just another thing. For me to keep saying we have to invest only in AI doesn't make sense. We have to pay creators, pay better artists, pay better the people that produce the content. We have to invest in uh, investigative journalism, in real content production. Not just in AI, because what we need is people that create content, culture, and creativity. And again, is the question of public goods. I think again, is coming back. But we need better salaries, maybe, for art workers. My heart workers. is singing. My favorite thing is people getting paid for work. Yes. I know this is the least favorite thing of the European Commission and investors in general in most cases. But believe me, it's quite fun. Yeah. I'm looking for, I think Andre had his hand up and there's a gentleman in the back row. I, I'm sorry, but we'll skip you this time because we have, we're kind of in the minus time. So let's go to Andre Vyakins first, first and then the gentleman. Well, I, um, I, I, uh, we heard a lot in the discussion about um, economy, business models and so on. And I, I wonder whether we can change the the framing a bit, because let's say, for me, this is a, a question of societal design and not a question of, of business model. And if we always look at it through sort of this neoliberal lens, we are always trying to catch up with uh, what's coming out of the economy and we're running behind. But if we look at it um, through a design of society, then, then we can actually set the parameters. It's a, it's a bit like we are talking about democracy and always asking what's the business model. And it a, it's a, also reminds me of the discussion on, on climate change. I mean, initially we looked at climate change, what's the business model of saying, I mean, we are at, 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 the, at the stage where we are looking at survival of mankind and we are still asking what's the business model. So, and, and here it is a similar in this discussion. We're asking all the time about investment, business model, um, and big companies, instead of saying, you know, how can we design a system from a societal perspective which works for us and makes our society in a democratic way work? And we will find whatever business model it needs, but I mean, you know, it needs us to design it first and not the companies, and we are trying to catch up. 
This is a very 20th century thing. I think that we had to come up with sales pitches for like the lowest levels of morality to even comply with those. Thank you, Andre Wilkins of the European Cultural Foundation. And let's take one more question from the gentleman in, in the back row. Thank you very much. My question is for Uyidiya, and uh, it has to do with uh, the African continent. In the time of Corona, Africa was left out because we didn't get the vaccines, but we are safe. We are still okay. <laughs> and um, Europe had it, and we didn't. So I'm seeing the same thing with AI, and um, Africa is left behind. There are a lot of people in Africa who don't have their information online, and they, are, they look safe. And, uh, but how can we, two questions, how can we disrupt the whole AI? Because we need to have an opposition to it, for it not to function. Or the other question is, how can Africa stay away from this soon-called atomic bomb? <laughs> well, uh, what I can say is that, yeah, the focus is only in EU, the US, and China. But I can say also that in Africa, like there is already regulation on data protection, for example. There are many countries that they are already aware of that, but by any means, we don't have the, I mean, we don't, this, 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 uh, this, this pieces of legislation doesn't, don't, don't arrive here. So maybe we can also like try to bring out like what, what kind of perspectives or principles or even priorities they have, because probably their priorities are completely different. And also uh, in Africa in general, like we have this perception of community. Uh, it is something that without the community, we cannot go further, right? And how probably this, these legislations that they are already shaping by themselves, and even they have their own data protection agencies, which is, I mean, something amazing. Um, and, and how they make sure that the community is inside. And I can see also that there's a lot of people, uh, ma mainly it is people that they, they, they have been studying in the US or in Europe, that they are also trying to develop their own AI systems in order to make sure that uh, their communities in, in, in back, in their, in, back in, their, in their homelands, they can still have like a better life with the use of AI. So yes, there's, there's people who are trying to find out um, uh, methods and stories in which AI can be really useful for their communities, for their people. And the, I mean, it is, it is true. The problem is that the information doesn't arrive. And by just trying to, just try to look to the other side, it do, I mean, it, it's not like they are not existing, they exist. But we still try to amplify those voices. And the opportunity, the funds that they perceive. I mean, we have to, of course, you have to acknowledge that the education that they receive in many cases, they come from out, it comes from outside. But they are still trying to provide and to bring back this knowledge to the community as we were doing for many years, like during the 50s and 60s, when many of our, of our, our families were going uh, to, to, to Europe to study and then go back to their communities and become doctors or just bring back this kind of knowledge to their, to their communities so that they, they could still be of, of use, right? So yeah, uh, uh, and not only about Africa, I mean, there's like a lot of movements around the globe that they are not being listened. And it doesn't mean that there's not people fighting and that they are not aware of what is happening. But of course, like uh, the, 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 the instruments or the tools that they, they, that they have at the moment, it is completely different. And also we have to think that, that kind of structures that they use in order to, for example, uh, run their systems. Probably those platforms they are being, uh, uh, the, the platforms that they are using probably are part of those big tech companies that we are trying to avoid. So, also, like it's that kind of dichotomy in which they have to participate in the AI systems or in, in the AI scene with the link, with having a strong link to, to many private companies, right? I mean, it is almost impossible to do that. And also, like how we see that the lack of funds in the end, it is driving them to go to other places mm -hmm. and try to investigate, to do more research in other places, which is also something that is true. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We'll close here. We're very much on the dot, on the money with the time, which rarely happens. 
Thank you. Thank you to Peter Pomerantsev, Oidia Oji Palino, Francesca Bria, and Matthias Pfeffer. And of course, to the audience for joining us this evening, it, here physically present and online, and for your questions too. See you again at the Bali soon. <laughs>